Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for your patience, and it's it's a pleasure to have you all here today with us. On behalf of the MBSAF Forum and the Goxie webinar series, I want to welcome you all to our webinar series on environmental governance of the mining sector. I am Eva Gurria with the MBSAF Forum and the United Nations Development Program team. And thank you for attending today's session on environmental monitoring part two. Can participatory environmental monitoring committees empower citizens to shape decision making? Today, I will help facilitate the session together with my colleague Diego Ochoa from the EMBSA forum team who will provide technical support. Now this webinar will complement last year's webinar on environmental monitoring, that was part one, entitled The Fundamentals and Access to Information. Now today's webinar explores the work of community-based environmental monitoring committees, as I said. And the goal is really for those participating to come away with a better understanding of how these committees work, what the role is, and what some of their strengths are as well as some of the challenges they face. During the webinar, we will address the question of whether the committees can empower citizens to shape decision-making on mining in their areas, and thus be a tool to prevent conflict from escalating. Cases from Peru and Mongolia will be used for discussion and sharing of experiences from different contexts. Now, for today's webinar, we have a fantastic group of speakers. And I'd like to introduce the first speaker and the moderator of today's webinar, Ms. Graciela Tapia, better known as Gachi. Gachi is a lawyer and mediator with 20 years of experience as global trainer and senior international expert in dialogue, mediation, and conflict transformation with a focus on social environmental issues, indigenous communities, and post-conflict settings. She's currently working at UNDP Argentina, providing technical assistance to the Secretaries of Environment and Mining, and designing participatory processes within the framework of the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. Now, before I hand over the microphone to Gachi, I'd like to address some of the logistics of today's webinar. We have one hour and 45 minutes for this webinar. And after all the presentations have concluded, we will proceed with a question and answer session. Now to make your questions, please write them on the chat box in the control panel in your screen. You can also ask the question by clicking on the hand icon in the control panel on your screen. And we will then proceed to open your mic so you can ask your question. So either using the hand icon or writing the question on the chat. I encourage you to think of your questions as you hear the presentations. And unless we open your mics, all attendees, except for speakers, will be in listening mode only to reduce interference and to facilitate communication. For speakers, I also encourage you to mute your own mics when you're not speaking, also to reduce interference. Now, as many of our participants are not native English speakers, myself included, I would like to remind speakers of the importance of speaking slowly and clearly. Lastly, this session is recorded and it will be available at the MBSAT Forum website. That is www.mbsatforum.net. And all the participants will receive an email with a link to watch um, the webinar as well as a PDF copy of the presentations. Now, without further ado, Gachi, you have the microphone and everyone enjoy this session. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Uh, welcome everyone to this dialogue and learning space. It's great that we can connect through our voices to share knowledge, experience, concerns, findings, lessons around this framing big question that they've already mentioned, which is 
if can participatory environmental monitoring committees empower citizens to shape decision make and i will go further and say if not what is needed uh, you know to make it happen hmm? so today we have this role of um, moderating the speakers in order to ensure space for everyone it's not a difficult role at all in this case but it makes me reflect and remark that in the framework of this topic we will address today the role of facilitating dialogue uh, making space for very diverse voices perspectives interests powers symmetries and sometimes even worldviews is one of the huge challenges of the process of making participatory committees be effective in this role of shaping decision making ensure mitigation provide transparency confidence mm -hmm. so i believe some of our speakers uh, may have these roles also besides the activist one perhaps within the audience also there may be facilitators helping committees to advance their task so i'm, I'm eager to learn more more on the strength and challenges that these committees have to face considering that in, in our in our field in our field which i understand is the dialogue and, and conflict transformation we expect that if doing this effectively we we can have this committees with a with a power of preventing escalation in, very, in all kind of conflicts, uh, while strengthening democratic ways of addressing the contradictions, the contradictions and challenges of sustainable development. So uh, I hope we will go through all these topics around, you know, how do we ensure confidence, you know, access to information, trust in the information, transparency, etc. So I'm very excited uh, being with you. Okay, so let's start with our first. Speaker. Our first speaker is Alexandra Hill. Alexandra is Project Officer for Extractive Industries in UNDP's Regional Hub for Latin American and the Caribbean. She's based on Panama, provides support and coordinates the research activity on community-based participatory environmental monitoring committees in the region within the project called Strengthening Environmental Governance for Sustainable Natural Resource Management. I'm personally very interested in, in, the, in this project. So we listen to you, Alex. Thank you, Gachi. Thank you for your introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, so before we get to, to our cases of monitoring committees presented by, by the guest speakers upcoming, I will take just a few minutes to speak about UNDP's work in this area and why the committee's work is of interest of, of UNDP. And, and as Gachi just said, I will specifically present a project we are implementing in partnership with the Canadian International Resources and Development Institute and with the help of the Latin American Dialogue Group. Uh, this project is on, on participatory environmental governance for sustainable natural resources management and is being executed in the in the Latin American and Caribbean region. So the anticipated delivery of a regional knowledge product that is outlined in, in the project that I will present is undertaken as a component of, of a multi-year global program on environmental environmental governance for sustainable natural resource management and this program is jointly implemented by the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency, the UNDP and funded by the Swedish International Development Agency. Globally, more broadly, the environmental governance program supports strengthen environmental go governance within the mining industry with a focus on how human rights and rule of law principles are integrated into the work of environmental agencies. And it is doing so in countries such as Colombia, Mongolia, Kenya and Mozambique. So the management of extractive sectors, being oil, gas, minerals, is as we all know a major challenge for developing countries because um, the exploitation of non-renewable natural resources has often triggered violent conflicts, degraded the environment, worsened gender and other inequalities, displaced communities, and undermined democratic governance. In contrast, it is an opportunity too. There are uh, plenty of cases where the effective management of a society's natural resources has unleashed sustainable and, and equitable human development. So, based on the 
on the lessons learned upon those cases, uh, UNDP released a strategy to support the efforts of resource-rich developing countries to design and to implement such policies, ensuring that wealth is transformed into advances in human development for all women and men. All this work contributes to the sustainable development goals that are, as you may know, the basis of the UN work in terms of development. And out of the 17 SDGs, six are directly related to the work of the participatory environmental monitoring committees in mining. So there is one target on goal three, for instance, seeking to reduce by year 2030 the number of deaths and diseases caused by water pollution. So in this regard, it is important to point out that the work of the committees on environmental monitoring has a health purpose. Other targets are linked to environmental education, women participation in decision-making processes, sustainable management of water, or as final example, one of the targets on goal 16 aims at creating effective, transparent, and accountable institutions at all levels. And this reinforces the definition of committees as organizations based on principles of transparency, participation, and representation. So the rationale behind this project comes from UNDP's search for solution to the negative consequences from expansion of large-scale mining. Um, recent research on the frequency of reported conflict situations between mining companies and communities shows a worrying progressive increase in 2000 and the formulation hired by a previous experience in 2016 and mining companies to date more than 140 committees are actually active in Peru so given promising results of some participants in Peru, while knowing there are still challenges, we want to better understand the committee's work in five to six countries in Latin America in 2018. Our main objectives are to identify the parameters and the context under which these committees can be created, providing examples of good practices, and if possible, sharing actionable policy and programming recommendations. One report based will be produced by Bolivia, Ecuador, Panama, Peru, and there is a possibility that also Colombia join us in this effort. So these case studies will be collected together in a global report with analysis across countries, and the findings will be verified at a regional dialogue with the participants uh, in the study in late June this year. This knowledge product will result for us uh, in a deeper understanding of, of participatory environmental monitoring committees. So while doing the research, we will ask ourselves what are the key characteristics of these committees that explain their successes, their failures, the key challenges they face, the opportunities to strengthen the committees, to link them to governance structures. And five areas of work will be studied we will have a look at the socioeconomic, political, environmental context, possibilities for capacity building, governance, and how to build good practices. In each of the areas, the research will seek to determine the role and the way of proceeding of not only the monitoring committees, but also everyone around them, such as community members, government, public administrations, mining companies, and other stakeholders. To conclude, let me show you some of the case studies that will be included in, in this research. In Argentina, we will visit uh, Minera Bajo de la Lumbrera, where a committee has been set up to monitor the mine closure. In Bolivia, we will be studying, for instance, the Mankiri Mining Enterprise in Cerro Rico in Potosí, that works in conjunction with mining cooperatives. Or in Panama, we will have a closer look at the work of uh, Minera Panama in two areas, in Cocle and in Colón, where there is a community protocol on, on how to regulate water in the basins. So these study cases, as well as the ones to be determining in Ecuador and in Peru, 
will help us understand what enables the committees to function most effectively in these countries of the region. And in the meantime, I'm sure we can learn a lot from the experts that follow my presentation. Thank you very much. You have more information on the link, on the link I'm attaching here. And you can always send me an email whenever you want. Thank you. OK, thank you, Alex. Thank you. Hope we will be very successful with this project. <laughs> now we will listen to Flaviano Biantini. Um, Flaviano is an environmental and human rights activist. He has more than 10 years of experience in developing and implementing community-based monitoring systems of extractive industries all over the world. He's a founder and director of Source International, an international NGO that was awarded with the Tech Award for the use of technology to benefit humanity. Congratulations, wow. Yeah, I just let me say that Flaviano's work with Source International is ongoing on this topic, uh, distinct from the UNDP uh, a project uh, research that, that Ale was, Alexander was mentioning that is just starting. So thank you, Flaviano. Now we listen to you. Thank you, and hi, everybody. Um, so I will explain you a little bit how we, in Source International, we develop uh, and we use the community-based monitoring system. First of all, uh, I think it's, it's important to understand what is a mine and how huge the impact of a mine can be. So, and so how the presence of a mining company itself can trigger conflicts inside the communities because especially in Latin America, there, is, uh, there are years of experience, uh, basically 500 years of experience of uh, mining companies doing um, harm, I mean, causing harmful consequences to local communities. So uh, this is an example, for example, in Peru. Uh, this is the Cerro de Pasco mine. It is, the, to me, one of the clear-cutting example in how not to do mining. Um, they say the, the mining company has, during the 50 years of the open pit accumulate debris all over the, uh, the, the cities and um, children in Cerro Pasco are forced to play soccer under the mining waste and even the hospital of Cerro Pasco is surrounded by mining waste. So when people get sick, they get to the hospital and what they, get, what they have around is mining waste where dust come up during the dry season and acid water goes into the ground during wet seasons, during rainy season. Uh, and this is the uh, water discharge of the mining company. There's no filter, there's no uh, purification, and this water contains uh, some heavy metals up to 1,000 times the limit, the national limit and the international standards. So there is uh, uh, this balance of power between the company and the community, and also uh, a, a possible conflict generation every time that we start to, to mine, uh, to dig for, for minerals or for oil or for gas or for whatever. So, so I, think, I think it is super important that the community has somehow a role to play, and especially it's the role of the watchdog. So the community must be able to control the mine. This is, according to me, one of the uh, sole uh, way to avoid the conflict, so that the community exactly knows what is happening inside their territories. Often what we can see is that when a mine opens a, a a project inside a community, the perception of the community is divided into two. There is a group of people that uh, normally inside the community, they want the job. And so they they think that the mine, everything the mine is doing is good. And then there is always a, a group of people, sometimes pretty big, that they, they are against the company and uh, they don't want the mine. And so for them, everything what happens inside the community is caused by the mine. Uh, the only way to avoid this division inside the community is that the community itself is able to effectively control what is happening and effectively knows what is happening. 
And so we know that one of the main uh, topic, one of the main concern when a mining company is right is the water. Uh, water is an element that is key for life. As we know, there is no any single uh, form of life that can survive without water, uh, as far as we know. And, um, and it is key for agriculture, for, for cattle growing, for humans and everything. And we also know that mining companies are, uh, the, um, are among the industries that more pollution to the water they can cause. So monitoring the water is, is very important for this reason, but there is also another more practical reason. Uh, monitoring water is easy and is cheap. Uh, what can we monitor in the water pretty cheaply? There's the, those are the elements uh, that uh, that we uh, can monitor into the water with a scientific uh, instrument, with a scientific point of view. And all of these are pretty cheap, easy, and effective. First of all, water responds very quickly to pollution, differently from soil, from air, from health effects. Uh, if I pollute today a soil, I will probably find the pollution into the soil next year. While water, it's very responsive. So if I pollute today, I will find the pollutant into the water today. And that's very important So, uh, also for a quick reaction from the community. pH, uh, I will go very, very quickly on those topics because uh, there are more technicality, but pH is basically uh, something that measure the acidity of the water and through the acidity of the water we can measure if there is a spill and we can also measure if there is an acid rock drainage that is one of the major concern on mining uh, so acid water that came out from the waste conductivity is basically measure the quantity of element dissolved into the water those elements can be pollutant or not so we have to do a step further. But if we can see uh, an increase of conductivity, a very quick increase, like in one day, that probably uh, uh, an indicator of a spill, a major spill. Temperature, we know what temperature it is. Uh, and in, uh, in, in, in monitoring the water of the mine, temperature is very important because some of the pollutant can have, if there is a spill, almost certainly, uh, the temperature of the water that is spilled is different from the temperature from, of the river, so you can see a different of the river of the different river temperature. And also, it's important on acid rock drainage because acid rock drainage it increases the temperature of the water. And then there is oxygen uh, dissolved, and that means the quantity of oxygen that is dissolved into the river, and that is a key element for the life of the river itself. So fishes and all the other um, plants and, and um, shrimps and all the uh, animals who live into the water, they need oxygen inside the water. All those four elements uh, are really, really easy to analyze with this, this instrument that you can see in this picture in Mexico. Uh, so at community level, it's very easy to, to do it. And the instrument, it's you can buy a, a very good instrument for $500. So it's something that every, almost every community can afford, at least with a small support from uh, NGO government or, or even from the mining company. Um, so it's, it's a cheap instrument. Uh, it's easy to use because modern instrument, they really is just push a button and they give you the results. And our, those results are kind of easy to understand because uh, it's a change of a number. If you have a pH that normally is eight and suddenly they become five, that's something wrong in it. Uh, and it's very easy to understand for everybody. Uh, this is a, a similar instrument. It's another model, but do the, exactly the same thing is in Mongolia. And uh, with those instruments, you can then measure those four elements. There is a, then as we saw, uh, we have to do a step further in order to get more information. And there are some elements that are very relevant when we talk about mining. 
and those are heavy metals. They are one of the major concern. So like lead, arsenic, cadmium, chromium, zinc, uh, iron, manganese, those are elements that the nature itself of mining can mobilize and therefore you can find into water. And then there are other elements that are more um, related to major need to spill like cyanide uh, or sulfate or nitrate or other type of elements. And in that case, you need uh, lab analysis. Uh, but so what you can do at, at community level is collect the water samples. So you have to collect half a liter, one liter, it depends from, from, the, from the laboratory. Sometimes it's even smaller, smaller samples. Preserve with a few drops of preservant and ship it to the lab. And it's, again, something that can be done at community level from, for, from pretty much everybody. Uh, so easily, easily you can, you can uh, do those kind of, kind of analysis. Measure directly in situ inside the community, something like pH, temperature, conductivity, and dissolve oxygen with a easy instrument, and then something more detailed that needs a laboratory, but the community can collect the sample. This is by far the most important monitoring, as we said before. But, but there is also the air monitoring, because one of the major concerns also in mining activity, especially in dry area, is the air pollution. And when we, when we talk about air pollution, uh, it's, we talk mainly about uh, dust. So dust in the air uh, and how this dust can affect uh, people because people can breathe that dust. And something that is always underestimated is the point that that dust deposit on everything. And very often, if you have, think about you at your home in your normal life, you probably have food that stay outside of containers uh, and therefore the dust during time can deposit on that food and then if you wash it before eating it's then you can get polluted it's, it's something uh, it seems stupid somehow but it's something that happened very often is one, one of the main reason to get um, pollutant inside your body you get an apple you put it on the table you leave it for one day and all that mining dust deposit on the apple and then you take it and you eat the apple and you are eating the dust uh, so those are the instruments that we normally use. Uh, as you can, I don't know if you can see my counter, but I hope uh, is this part is is a filter that is two centimeters of of diameter, uh, and this is a pump that pump four liter per minute. So basically, this one simulate a lung, and this one simulate your mouth uh, and your nose. So there's a filter inside there that, that can uh, basically trap all the dust that gets into your, uh, into your lung. And you can use it in two ways. One is like in the picture. So you put it on a, uh, on a fixed position and you measure the quantity of dust that stay there for 8, 10, 12 hours. The other way is to put it into a person. So it's like a personal instrument. You put it in someone and this person do their normal life and, uh, and see what, what, how many uh, dust they breathe during the day. And it's very useful, especially if you, if you use it for workers. So if you, and, and that's particularly true in underground mining. So if you work in an underground mine, you can use that kind of instrument to measure how many dust you will breathe in your normal day. And then another very important thing is the health monitoring, because that's actually at the end, uh, the, the very last um, concern. So why we want clean water? Because we, want, we don't want to get sick. So in that case, health monitoring is something very relevant. Uh, it is important to mention that differently from water, as we said before, water is very responsive. Health monitoring is not very responsive. Uh, if I pollute the water and the environment today, health affectation you will see in a couple of years or sometimes even more, depending from which kind of affectation. And this is something more difficult to do at community level. 
level, but like hair analysis, for example. So through uh, the analysis of hair, of hair, you can you can uh, uh, detect how many heavy metals people have have accumulated inside their bodies. But there is also another thing that can be done and at a community level is the measure of sickness. So for example, every time that someone get into the into an hospital, there is a register. And in this register, people, I mean, the doctor sign, uh, what's the reason why you get into the hospital? So as soon as the mind starts, you can organize inside the committee of the community to get to the hospital like once a week, once every two weeks, once a month, and get those reasons without a name, of course, for, um, security for for privacy reasons but you can collect all this data so at the beginning you will see probably that 60 percent of people going into the hospital are going there for diarrhea for example is something pretty common uh, but then you can see a change during the years again this is not responsive this is something happening years but maybe three years later you can see that there is an increase of people going to the hospital for skin disease, for example, that is one of the main and the first uh, sickness that came out uh, when there is pollution. Or you can also see an increase of cancer, but that's normally something that happened pretty late during the process. So it might be several years later. And then uh, the social monitoring. So how the social life, how does the, the, the social impact of mining uh, happen? And this is definitely, by definition, this must be done at community level. Uh, it is impossible for even the best specialist of the world who really detect the social change, the social conflict, the social um, problems caused by an external influence inside uh, an indigenous communities in the middle of the jungle. Uh, uh, so, for example, this is uh, one of the classic social um, uh, monitoring system and is the community mapping of, of the mine and the community mapping of uh, the problems caused by the mine. So, as you can see, uh, there is the mine in the center, this is again Cerro de Pasco, so the picture we saw at the beginning and the division of all the municipality and these are what they perceive as the environmental passives so this is the called this montermiana so are some mining wastes this is our other mining waste this is a, 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 a polluted lakes um and this is another mine so as you can see it's like the perception of the change of their community for like from the community perspective and another, for example, key issue is like the measuring of water, as of distance of water. With a GPS, that is an instrument that, again, very cheap. Nowadays, you can find GPS for $150 or even less sometimes. Um, sometimes you can even transform your, your phone into a GPS. This is in the Amazon forest, this picture in the Peruvian Amazon forest. And uh, you can measure, for example, from, from the, the distance from your home to the water because we have seen in several cases into the mining uh, they use a lot of water so sometimes some river uh, draw uh, and therefore people are forced to go more far for getting water and this is a social issue and it's very important but how to measure it so uh, a 150 dollar gps can enable to community enable to com communities to uh, measuring properly, but very very important in these issues is that everything is done with transparency and is a key element the communication inside the community and outside the community. So it is important that the committees goes to monitor, but that sometimes maybe once every three months, every six months, they involve a major part of the community. So this is picture is, for example, in, in Mexico, in Guerrero, where the committee is made by six persons, but every six months they, they make a, a public visit to the mine and they show what they are doing to everybody that want to join. So in this case, we had a couple of hundred people and, and uh, 
they bring all those people to the edge of the mine to see the mine from the top and then they involve them into water monitoring. So it's very important to communicate inside the community in order to avoid conflict inside the community and also external communication. So it's very, very relevant, especially in rural areas, in rural communities, it's very relevant the radio community community radios are normally the main issues of communications uh, when we go in the rural uh, part of the world um, we cannot think like in the cities it, that's not internet access is not the same as we normally have but community radios are very very relevant to communicate what you're doing and so this is key and tr for transparency those are so for us the main reason why uh, community-based system can prevent the conflicts. Uh, I will go through very fast because I'm running out of time. Uh, but it gives community control over the resources, empowered community. It's trade the resilience of the community. It's very it empowers women inside the community because uh, on the committees and you will see in the example later, there always a very important. Uh, positive woman in our case we always do 50 percent and some issues has been done much better by women especially if we talk about water monitoring because uh, they have more contact with water normally uh, historically and traditionally and also the social issues they are more uh, sensible to any social change it monitors human rights and therefore prevent abuses and it prevent company misconduct if the company knows that the community is monitoring them they will think twice before doing a misconduct. And it prevents corruption because, as I mentioned, it's transparent and the communication, so it's very open. In strained communities, internal communication is even for other reason. Once you get the committee and you know how to communicate, then you can use this type of communication even for other things. And it helps community to get a better deal with the companies and government. Uh, thank you very much much for your attention this is my email and you can write me if you have any specific questions and those are all the information about source international and i will stay here for your questions later on thank you very much flavia non gachi would you like to take over Hello? Yes, we hear Hello. you. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you, Flaviana. <laughs> Great presentation. Okay, now we will listen to uh, Bolorma Burkhab. Bolorma is Chair of Stakeholders Engagement for Sustainable Development, CESD, Mongolia. Uh, she has over 15 years of experience in leading development projects and programs in broad economic and social development topics. She has also worked in stakeholders engagement and extractive industries and community development. She facilitated a process of local multi-stakeholders multi councils establishment and development of environmental management plans to balance economic growth and environmental protection to produce positive social outcomes. So thank you, Boloma. We'll listen to your presentation. Okay. Good morning, uh, hello everyone, uh, and thank you very much for the introduction. So, Bol Bolorma, sorry, there, there we are. Okay. Yes. Could you just could you just make it uh, in presentation mode? Mm -hmm. Sure. Can you see it now? One second there. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, and that's okay now. Can I start now? Yes, please, Bolorma, go ahead. Okay. Oh, hello everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction. And uh, just before we go to my presentation, I would like to uh, say a little bit about the organization. So, stakeholders engagement for sustainable development 
Uh, it is national uh, non-for-profit, uh, non-governmental organization, and it was established uh, very recently, uh, a year ago, as a result of the very successful um, stakeholders' engagement for sustained development program, which was uh, uh, implemented for six years uh, in 50 communities with the mining developments. And to really, the main mission is to continue uh, the good result and good practices, which uh, we have actually uh, came out from this uh, six years program. And the six years program was implemented with the, uh, with the Asia Foundation and also with the government institutions and the local communities. So, um, as you know, um, Mongolia is um, um, uh, mining is very important uh, for Mongolian economy. Uh, in 1992, uh, the government of Mongolia actually announced uh, a gold program as a response to economic shocks that we had during that time. And this actually led to rapid uh, mining developments in the country. So, uh, Mongolia has a lot of different uh, minerals, but the main are gold, coal, copper, uh, tungsten, and phlospa. Uh, and we, uh, as you can see, uh, Mongolia ha already issued uh, over uh, 3,000 uh, mining licenses out of which 1,500 or 1,500 are exploitation licenses, which means they are really exploiting the minerals. And uh, um, currently, uh, since that, uh, we, uh, Mongolia is, has been implemented for 25 years now, this mining project, and now we have all spectrum of mining. We have multinational mining companies, national, medium, small scale, and even the artisanal minings. So those uh, uh, companies or this mining represent uh, very different uh, ris uh, risks and also some of them good, but some of them different. So all we experiencing all different levels of environmental and social accountability with these companies. So in 2000, uh, early 2000, uh, Mongolia has experienced a lot of uh, uh, impacts from the mining. And during that time, uh, we had a uh, lot of grassroots movements. And this is the response was like to how mining companies and local communities need to work together in order to avoid this uh, uh, bad environmental impacts, but also how to make the mining really to work for the local sustainable development. And this is why we, uh, was, uh, our program was looking how to constructively engage stakeholders. So uh, in many places we talk about this process, but it's very important that people, especially the community people, need to learn how to participate and how to get uh, most of it. So therefore, special emphasis is really given first to the capacity building local communities, but also local officials. And um, I think it's a very important part for stakeholders engagement. So we see the stakeholders engagement as a main tool to really engage mining companies, local communities, and local government. And this is the way we see how we can make uh, mining companies more responsible uh, and also uh, make local communities to uh, more uh, uh, better to participate in all these decisions 
and multi-stakeholders committees which was established in those communities really provide this opportunity for the local community to raise their concerns, their views, uh, their interests, and to become really uh, partners for local development. So our uh, capacity building efforts and uh, especially access to the uh, relevant information to local communities really uh, helped us to facilitate this process of establishing local multi-stakeholders council. So local multi-stakeholders uh, committees representing uh, uh, local government, local communities and money companies. The local stakeholder uh, uh, committees, uh, uh, citizens are represented uh, by herders, some, uh, local um, teachers, school teachers, and also the hospital uh, staff, doctors. So these are a very important. Uh, and also in uh, many uh, sub-provinces in Mongolia, we have uh, NGOs like women NGOs and elderly uh, seniors uh, association because these people also are represented in the uh, local stakeholders committees. From the government side, mostly uh, uh, members are represented like environmental inspector, land officer, and of course itself there's a sub-province governor. And uh, in some places, uh, we have a community called, a uh, small administration unit in Mongolia called PAC. So, uh, PAC governors are also represented in the local stakeholder committee. Uh, from the money company, it's very important that it's represented by the person who can make decisions. If someone from the money company just comes to participate in these meetings, it's not uh, very uh, uh, sufficient uh, because mining companies, uh, because in the local multi stakeholders committees, uh, decisions are made. And if the mining company representative cannot make decisions, it's very challenging. Therefore, uh, it's very important to know that local multi stakeholders committees, companies are, are, are represented by the uh, authorities who can make decisions. So uh, the local multi-stakeholder committee's uh, main mission is to reach the environmental conservation, uh, address environmental issues which actually come out because of the mining. So that's the, the ultimate goal and therefore it's very, um, it is very important that these committees really work together, the members. Usually in Mongolia, the members uh, meet uh, on the quarterly basis. But in order to make this uh, local multi-stakeholders committees work very visible, usually they, uh, they develop a one-year annual action plan. And this annual action plan actually represents uh, the, uh, actually addressing the environmental issues, but in many cases also they provide, uh, many places they also inc include the social um, activities. So uh, I would like to just focus on the one of the case of uh, Ultitsa province of Tundgop uh, uh, province. So this is the uh, uh, a lot of mining in this uh, sub province. Mostly uh, there are uh, uh, gold and uh, phlospa mining. Uh, the uh, the zone is located uh, about 365 kilometers from the capital city. It has uh, over one million and five hundred uh, forty-five thousand hectares of land and uh, population of uh, over two thousand people and the number of the livestock is significant. Uh, right now, the, according to Mongolian Mineral Sources Authority, 
uh, they have over 200 licenses uh, issued. However, only 35 uh, money companies um, registered with the local uh, uh, local government. Mm. So uh, how the LMC worked and uh, what is the main uh, results? So LMC actually helped to solve uh, one of the environmental degradation which was caused by the uh, mining, small and medium mining. Uh, what happened is that uh, many uh, lands were abandoned after the mining from 1990s, early 90s. And then uh, uh, this uh, degradation of the land caused a lot of uh, health and uh, safety issues. So through the LMCs, actually the local government uh, allocated money for the environmental uh, rehabilitation of the abandoned land and the land uh, was the, the rehabilitated uh, through the community. Uh, the other thing is that uh, in order to support local communities, the mining company said that uh, they will buy flow spa from the local community who actually mining the flow spa, not from everyone. So the local multi-stakeholder committee was very instrumental for the sharing information and supporting local uh, community, including the artisanal miners. So this way we see that uh, local multi-stakeholder committees using their information, having meetings and sharing the plans was very important to define the actions and to really solve the local environmental issues uh, together and within the communities themselves. We also learned that uh, having uh, one year actual annual action plans was very good. It was really helping the people to come together to meet, to know each other's plans and it will really start building the relationship and trust between the stakeholders. Uh, annual action plans really were also good that they addressed immediate concerns. But we also learned that the action plans do not um, capture the, all the, the community's uh, cultural values and also there are people in the communities who are not represented in the LMCs. In the LMCs. Therefore, uh, it was very important to develop more uh, long-term plans. In this case, uh, we actually facilitated this environmental management plan. The environmental management plans actually is a mid there is actual mid-term. Uh, planning tool. It defines all the natural resources that the sub-province has. It defines uh, how many stakeholders, which stakeholders use what kind of natural resources, how many fees comes from which uh, res uh, resources. So it was very important that everybody, especially the community, can see what stakeholders use what resources and what fees and are provided to the local government. So the uh, objective of the sub province environmental management plan was to really assess the local natural resources use, its impact on the environment, and consult all stakeholders for participatory planning process and really for towards the sustainable development. So as I said, the uh, Sub-province environmental management plan embraces the cultural and historical values of Sub-province. Those really, uh, therefore, uh, embraces the values of the local communities. 
For example, the, when the process of uh, environmental management plan has started, they need to really develop, define what's the vision of the zone. And it was the community who actually said, we want our place in five years or in, in the future become this. For example, they said a really green Uzit sub-province. We know the mining, it, uh, the uh, natural uh, minerals will finish and the mining will finish. They still want to have their other economy. Therefore, they define it now. From now, we want like Uzit Sum will really echo Sum. They want to bring more uh, life, uh, <coughs> doing other economic activities. And therefore, this uh, environment rehabilitation of degraded land, helping the, their uh, improve the state of the land and to, uh, to make the zone uh, viable in terms of the economy. And the mission of that, as they define it, they want that every stakeholders who use the natural resources really be more responsible and to make sure that this uh, economic growth was together with the ecological balance. Uh, Sorry, Will Orma, to interrupt, just want to remind you of the time. We're running a little bit out of time. Okay, so uh, we just uh, want to say that um, there are uh, the different aspects of the uh, environmental management plans. So you can see that it's very uh, clearly defines the roles uh, of the stakeholders and what they have to do, and it's very important. Mm, so it really makes uh, to reduce and eliminate conflicts and find the ways to resolve disparities and increase environmental monitoring by stakeholders and improves accountability. And what is important that this uh, environmental management plan have its vision and mission and it's uh, defined through the consultation process. And you need to remember that is it integrated plan? Uh, and it should be also working, as you need to understand it's a working document because many changes happening. So therefore this plan should be updated over a certain time and this is why the committees need to have like meetings at least every uh, quarterly, which usually they do. And what uh, uh, lessons we learned that, uh, you know, uh, changes in the government after the election uh, it's very challenging because uh, this uh, member of the government in the uh, LMC actually changes. So then you have to explain again, start again, all the process, how it was done. So it takes a lot of uh, time and you need to build capacity of the new members. And it also was very important that among the general public, you do need to uh, uh, raise awareness and support of uh, different levels of government is essential and facilitate cooperation or communication between the all levels of the government and, and then also it's uh, many funds must be secured uh, sometimes uh, the, uh, the national government gives money as funds to the local government and sometimes it not happen so in this regard the uh, funds should be secured to implement the actions thank you very much So this is the end of the, my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Polorman. Kati? Adi, can you listen to me? Yes. OK, we will go quickly to the next one, Oscar Rada's presentation. Uh, Oscar Francisco Rada Santibáñez, Supervisor of Participati Participatory Monitoring Programs, Pro Naturaleza. Since 2007, Oscar has served Pro Naturaleza, Peruvian Foundation for the Conservation of Nature, as the coordinator of the Technical Assistance Office for the Design and Implementation of Participatory Environmental Monitoring Programs for Communities, Companies, and Governments. This office is, the, is in charge of community monitoring programs for oil and gas extraction <laughs> and transportation projects in the Peruvian jungle. Uh, since, unfortunately, uh, Oscar is not able to make the presentation uh, himself, he's not with us, but he was very kind to send us 
uh, I will ask Eva. Um, I hope Eva, you can do this maybe in 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 a cup in ten minutes uh, to to present on behalf of Oscar. Um, uh, Eva Gurria from UNDP uh, will deliver then in English the presentation on behalf of Oscar. Uh, however, let me remind that we can ask questions and we will later send him and he will um, be available for email in order to, to answer our, our questions or concerns. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gachi. I'm just seeing that you can see my notes. Um, I'm wondering if this will make things better. Uh, Gachi, can you see my full screen now? Yes. yes Perfect. Sure. And you can hear me well. Fantastic. Yes. Well, good morning again, everyone. And as Gachi said, I will be delivering the presentation on behalf of Ms. Oscar Rada from the Peruvian Foundation for the Conservation of Nature, Pro Naturaleza in Spanish, who unfortunately I won't be able to join us anymore today. Uh, but it's a fantastic case study for Naturaleza has 15 years of experience in community environmental monitoring in the gas industry in Peru. So let me be so the Peruvian Amazon constitutes 13% of the Amazon basin and is one of the most biodiverse places on the planet, harboring more than 68 million hectares of tropical forests. This region is inhabited by 14% of the Peruvian population and is home to 52 indigenous peoples groups. It's a very important area. It constitutes 60% of the national territory, but has a small economy, around 5% of the national GDP. However, it is affected by underdevelopment, uh, by underdeveloped infrastructure, by limited governance, that contributes to low levels of human development of its population. And of course, in this scenario, the conservation of biodiversity and the sustainable development of the Peruvian Amazon results in a unique challenge. Now, let, let me give you a little bit more context on Peru as well. Um, many regions of Peru, there are high levels of social conflict, uh, many of them social environmental and these conflict, conflicts have escalated for very recent, including uh, minimal attention to some of the underlying causes of conflict and an absence of an effective dialogue between the actors involved. So this brings us to today's webinar, of course, because this has limited and challenged the possibility of sustainable development, human welfare, and the growth of the economy and it has created a negative scenario for many of those involved um, and for the country at large. So there is, of course, in Peru, a challenge of sustainable and inclusive development that requires social environmental management that provides an effective strategy in the management of different investment projects and development processes at the national, regional, and local levels. So today, Pro Naturaleza wanted to share its experience and institutional learning from the work in the past 15 years assisting community environmental monitoring processes in the field of extractive industries. And um, the experience goes back to the year 2002 when Pro Naturaleza began collaborating with companies in the hydrocarbon sector. Now, um, its participation in the Camisea gas project, which is one of the largest extractive investments in the country, included the design and implementation of three monitoring programs that happened at different times and in different areas. So you can see the first one, the Community Environmental Monitoring Program of the Lower Urubamba. That was for lots 88 and 56, operated by the Camisea Consortium, led by Plus Petrol Corporation. Then you can see the second one in High Urbamba Community Environmental Monitoring Program for the Jungle Gas Transportation System, 
It was operated by Transportadora del Gas del Peru. And finally, you can see the one at the bottom, um, the Participatory Social Environmental Monitoring Program for the gas pipeline operated by Peru LNG. And that was uh, started in 2008. So let me give you a little bit more details on these three monitoring programs. The one from Bajo Urubamba began its implementation in 2002 and involves 22 monitors from nine native communities and two rural settlements, as well as a coordination committee made up of six members representing indigenous federations, Kekonama, Komaru, and Pekonai. Now, this is the first community monitoring program that was created in the framework of hydrocarbon activity in the country and has become a benchmark for citizen monitoring experiences in these types of operations. The second one in Alto Urubamba was implemented from 2004 and became the first monitoring program for the operation of a pipeline in the Peruvian high forest. This is made up of 20 monitors from nine communities of the Matilenka ethnic group and a coordinating committee represented by the Kumaru Federation, which monitor the right of way of the gas pipeline that passes through the territories of the native communities. Now, the last one, as I said, Participatory Social Environmental Monitoring Program was implemented since July 2008 and is the first participatory monitoring experience in the construction and operation phase of a gas pipeline in the Andean and coastal areas of the country. Now, for the construction phase, it involved 84 monitors belonging to 35 rural communities, Guayacucho and Huancavelica, rural properties and population centers of Ica. And currently, in the operation stage, 34 local monitors participate in the program. So now, in order to carry out the monitoring program that I've been talking about, Pro Naturaleza developed different methodological and operational tools to strengthen the technical capacities of the men and women who represent their communities as monitors. Now, Flaviano already spoke a little bit about this, but of course the aim is to ensure that the monitoring actions are based on technical arguments and objectives, and that through the monitoring, they can develop the skills to verify whether the environmental and social commitments made to the company have been fulfilled. And of course, in this way, conservation and the management of the natural and cultural heritage is sought through the reconciliation of corporate interests with those of local populations, ensuring that the highest environmental and social quality standards are met. Now, with this particular work, um, with regards to the results, um, indigenous peoples, peasant, and rural settlement communities were better informed about the work carried out by the companies in the territories and established a relationship of trust between the company and the local inhabitants that is based on efficient communication mechanisms and can therefore avoid possible social conflicts. In addition, it has been possible for communities and towns to increase their environmental awareness and to establish favorable conditions to implement environmental education programs, as well as solid waste management, and in some areas, even programs for the recovery of endangered species. All of this with the involvement of the local population and therefore enhancing a greater exercise of environmental citizenship. Now, also during the past 15 years, Pronatura has seen that monitoring has benefited the communities in many ways, some of which were also addressed by Flaviano. One of the most important is the reduction of the real risk to their lives and property, 
due to the early warning mechanism that can prevent accidents. Another, and a big one, is a confidence in the information they receive. Because the information is collected by the community monitors themselves, community members have greater confidence that the risk to them, or their assets, are being objectively informed to the communities, the state, and the company, so that these risks are taken care of and controlled. Now, these benefits extend beyond those to the communities themselves to all the actors involved, including companies, government, and society in general. Now, recognizing this, sectors such as energy and mines and environment have even given norms incorporating these experiences of monitoring programs into public policies, which is a great achievement. And in recent years, parliamentary groups and civil society actors have proposed bills to strengthen these processes. Now, to conclude, it is clear from the work for the past 15 years from Pronatura that environmental and social community or participatory monitoring is very important for social environmental management and are key to building a future society for communities that live in the fields of extractive operations. Thank you very much. And this is it for me, Gachi, back to you. Thank you, Eva. Thank you very much. So now uh, we will open the space to questions and answers. At this time, I will leave the facilitator role to Eva and will take advantage of my open mic to start with one question to Flaviano. Uh, Flaviano, you mentioned that usually there are two groups in the community and, and, and one of them very resistant to the activity, and to, the, to the mining activity. So my question is, how do you manage or who manages the resistance? Uh, the escalation of conflicts among these different, you know, sectors of the community, uh, and how is this impacting the work of the committees? Well, I think this is the, um, as I was mentioning before, the, the key element in this sense is the transparency of the process. So if uh, everything is done with the, with the transparency and everybody can access to the information of the committee, then also the, the, the resistance group can somehow dialogue uh, within, within their group and within the other groups. Um, generally, I, I think that if you do a proper scientifically based uh, monitoring, uh, you can basically use science as a common ground of dialogue between the different parts inside the communities and therefore reduce drastically uh, the conflicts. Okay, thank you. I, I, I remark again the role of, of some of, of, the, um, of the professionals that are doing this work and how, how to find key, key actors in order to build some bridges in, 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 in these situations. I'm thinking very uh, especially in our context. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead with um, Eva and, and some of the, of, of the questions from the audience. Definitely. Thank you very much, Gachi. And I'd like to read the first question from, from Ana Cabria Melache. Can you mention some concrete strategies to address tensions and conflicts within the community itself in relation to the activity of the committee and its legitimacy? And I think this would be open to all the panelists. Flaviano, maybe, would you like to start? Can, can you please repeat the question? Uh, it was, I was interrupted. Yes, of course. So can you mention some concrete strategies 
to address tensions and conflicts within the community itself in relation to the activity of the committee and its legitimacy. So I'm wondering if either you or Gatti or any of the speakers, yeah. Bolorma, you, you can uh, provide any answers to this particular question from Ana Cabria. I mean, there's a, in my experience, there's no a specific strategy, uh, but I underline again the importance of the transparency uh, in that sense. So uh, I think that once again, doing it in the most possible transparent way, it will help to avoid the conflict in first, and if the conflict arises, then to address it. Um, another, th when, the, when the conflict is already in place, another strategy can be a, a dialogue table. So uh, or a meeting inside the room and try to talk to the people uh, involved in the conflict. And again, make it open. So let people get in, let people listen to, to, to the topics and, I, I repeat, if everything is done in the most transparent way, uh, it can be very uh, powerful in avoiding the conflict at first, but also in mitigating the conflict when they rise. Okay. Um, and anybody else got to? Well, yes, I was thinking, uh, and, and Flaviano's answers about trying to talk, you know, and and how do you put a fair process to talk, and how do you build confidence in 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 this space for talking, you know, because usually the problem is that in these communities, people they don't trust each other, and so they need to trust the process, and and then you know maybe asking them for what is an indicator. Of trust for them, and 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 trying to to pick up very strategic people in which they trust, and put them together as bridge builders, uh, in order to to make them participate of this, um, you know, exercise of transparency and 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 understanding that you know, um, they they really could have a very serious and legitimate concerns. Uh, I, I still think this, depending on the context and on the communities, uh, uh, is it, is more more difficult from one to another. But I think uh, a good process could let could, could help. You know. Um. Mm -hmm. uh, I just would like to share our experience. Please. Yeah. And I think the first meeting of the stakeholders is very important to establish the trust or to build the relationship. And we usually really give a lot of emphasis in, for the preparation of the first meeting. So the first meeting should have very clear agenda. And the date for the first meeting should be communicated well in advance. So really, ask as much as community people can come in. So therefore, it was very important. So we asked at that time, the companies really prepare a presentation about what's their plan, what, how many years they will go, what will be first year, how, uh, what is environmental management plans, how much the funds they put. So they, uh, this information should be given in the first meeting, officially during the presentation, and also how much the fees given for the first year to local government. And local governments also we ask it make presentation uh, how much the funds they receive. So this is, as Fabian already uh, uh, told, transparency was very important. And so that the first meeting agenda, like and when it should come, should be very well communicated in advance. The second uh, strategy uh, or tactic, I would say, the first uh, my site visits very important. It also built the trust. So the after the meeting, uh, there is a process. Who will be members of the local multi stakeholders committee? And actually, the people were selected who will represent them. So this is uh, again. Um, 
transparency was important and people also really discussed it, who will be representing them. Like they saying like, oh, this person who has more communication skills or more knowledge from their community will be represent them. And um, I think this mining site visits was very important to see how mining operates, how much water they use. So that's my kind of uh, experience. Thank you so much, Polorman and all the presenters for your, your response. So I have a, a comment from one of the participants. His name is Andre Javier. In the first presentation, some of the examples of how water quality is affected were given making reference to a potential spill resulting from mining operations. Although this is true, there are other reasons why the quality of water can change. For instance, due to effects of climate change, glaciers in Peru are retreating, which is resulting in exposing mineralized rocks that are now leaching metals into the water streams. As the rock drainage is exacerbated by industrial activities, including mining, but there are other causes to it. And um, he just wanted to see if you had any additional comments of Flaviano, or we could just leave it as as a input to this conversation. Well, no, I I have additional comments, and uh, well, the first thing, the increases that are caused by climate change or other issues are very slow. So you can definitely measure this increase, but this is something that you measure over months. Well, if there is a spill, it's something that you may well actually even over a year. If there is a spill, it's something that you measure over minutes or hour as a maximum. So uh, you can see, I mean, the change that is done from natural issues, it changed from 100 to 101 and then 102 and then maybe 105 in one year, while a spill changed from 100 maybe to 6,000 in one hour. So you can uh, isolate the two different reasons. As for the acid rock drainage, um of course i mean you have to observe the environment if the if the acid rock drainage come from uh normally exposed rocks in that case it's an acid rock drainage and naturally occurred but if it comes from an area where you have a lot of stockpiles uh, of mining waste in that case is of course caused by mining and you can always measure the water upstream and downstream to a stockpile or uh, a mining waste and therefore measure the the change in concentration uh, and and that gives you an information if there is is the mine or sometimes it can happen as as he said that the acid rock drainage came from uh, natural issues upstream the mine but in that case you won't see the difference between upstream and downstream so you can somehow isolate and uh, and and see the difference between uh, naturally occurred and not naturally occurred. Thank you very much, Fabiano, for your response. Before I continue reading some of the questions, I would also like to encourage the attendees to, to pose the questions yourselves by raising your hand on the control. And I will open up your mic so you can pose the questions yourselves. Or please continue sending them to the chat box, whatever you prefer. But we like to have an interactive dialogue. So I will share um, two questions with the presenters. The first one is um, just in case you you have a response. Um, Nicolas Onema um, says, as you know, the Democratic Republic of Congo is really rich in minerals, and the exploitation of mineral resources comes without good studies. Do you have any suggestions or proposals that could help the environmental governance and the management of the mineral resources in Africa? Of course, with a particular uh, focus on the DRC. And then the second question is the following. What are the best strategies that have best served to ensure that the recommendations or observations of the committees have a real impact on the decision-making processes. 
So colleagues, uh, would anybody like to address the, the first question in case you have any ideas about interesting um, suggestions about the African context? Well, I, I may refer to some projects that are already being executed in the, in, in the Congo in the case of the DRC. Uh, well, I can send uh, this person who, who asked the question some information specifically, but there is a, a, a EU-UN partnership on land, on natural resources, and conflict prevention specifically take place in the DRC and in the region of the of Great Lakes. So it addresses environmental governance. And there's also a very interesting initiative called uh, MAPX from the World Bank and UNEP with an organization uh, called GRID that is based in Geneva. And it is actually a mapping uh, taking place in Afghanistan and in the DRC that assesses the performance of extractive industry in those countries. Uh, their motto is that this is the next transparency revolution in the extractive industries. So I will send, uh, I will send him more information on email, but he can somehow get inspired by these two initiatives that are, are already taking place. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Unless anybody would like to add to that, maybe go to the second question on strategies that have served to ensure that the recommendations of the committees have a real impact on decision-making processes. Uh, Bolorma, Fabiano. Yeah, um, in terms of the, um, our experience that actually these environmental management plans, uh, they have already um, adopted by the local government. And I think uh, it's um, important that this recommendation included, if the community recommendation included in the plans, which is uh, adopted by the local governments, it will go, it will sure, make sure that it will implement it. So I would say that those recommendations should be part of the government policies or the program that should be implemented. That's why we in Mongolia developed this environmental management plans as a midterm planning tool, which is adopted now by the local government to ensure that this, you know, the aspirations and the plans and voices of the communities implemented. Can I add a little more please, comment on that? Please, please. I think, that, you know, that Boloma is right. I think that, that having the local government being part of the committee and having them, you know, participating in the process and, uh, and, and, the, and in the discussions and in the dialogue process and building confidence among them could be also a, a good strategy you know, to make some of these um, uh, um, recommendations to be then effectively implemented. Anybody else? Laviano, would you like to complement any of the previous answers? Uh, no, I think they, uh, they, they got everything. They cover pretty much everything, I think. Mm. I just also would like to add that uh, shared vision, the vision they actually come in, the defining, it's so important. And because if the vision accepted by all stakeholders, then it really goes towards to how to achieve this vision. And this, then from that vision, all these plans coming out on a very comprehensive, very detailed step-by-step -step way. So I would say that defining the common vision, which is with the shared vision, is uh, was very important point in our case. And okay. this way that really makes uh, logic for everyone to implement actions to uh, accomplish their commitments. Thank you very much, Polorman. So I have um, a couple of final questions. Um, so Flaviano, 
How um, do the environmental impacts of mining differ for men and women? And given this, how do women play a different role in monitoring committees? And how do you or source support them? Well, there are two, uh, three actually main reasons why um, the impact of mining is, is major no, or on, on women. Uh, from a very scientific point of view, the, any kind of pollution of water, especially the heavy metal pollution, affected more women than men for three reasons. The first one is that traditionally women are, have more contact with water. So they wash dishes, they wash clothes, they wash the kids. So there is more direct contact with the pollutant. Uh, secondly, the women have uh, more fat in their body. And, and the fat is the part where you accumulate most of the uh, metals like mercury, lead, and 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 zinc, uh, and others. Uh, and third, because of the uh, uh, reproductive organs of, of women that are open uh, instead of one of the men, they are closed. So there is a, a an, op an open way for pollutant to get into the body. So those are the three main reasons why women it's, are more affected. And then there is also another reason that is more socially affected, because normally in, in a mining company, they work men. 90% of the work are for men. So there is, every time that there is a, a, a huge mining community, there is a, a huge disbalance of working opportunities for men than for women. and. Uh, that is, I mean, it's already something that we can see all over the world, but in that case, it increased even more. Uh, so for all those reasons, women are more affected. But at the same time, they are better indication. Uh, they work better as a monitoring, especially for the health monitoring, because the first to get sick are them and the kids, and they, the women have more contacts with the kids. So women are more effective to monitor health issues for the kids and for themselves. Uh, and, and also from the social issues, because women are often more integrated inside the communities, and, and so they have more contact with other people, and they can measure the social impact much better than, than men. So in our case, we always, uh, in all the committee that we work with, we have half women and half men. Um, and, but we always um, push for more involvement of women generally. And so uh, for, for two reasons, it's not just, a, as, as I mentioned, it's not just a, men, a, a matter of gender equality, it's also a matter of effectiveness. They are more effective in monitoring. Um, and so it's a kind of a win-win solution that we are pushing for. Thank you very much, Flaviano. And I have a question for Volorma. Mm -hmm. So in the case you shared from Mongolia, um, how does the linkage between the monitoring committee and the sub-provincial government help to strengthen the committee's work? Um, can you provide some insight on how the connection to sub-provincial government makes a difference? And I believe you mentioned this um, Slightly in your presentation, but if you could go a little bit deeper on how this relationship, this connection makes makes a difference. Okay. Yeah, the uh, local the local multi stakeholder councils are at the sub provincial level, so they all stakeholders are there and they really know the situation. That's why they can come out with very clear action plans and what's the state of the local so environmental situation, yeah? So if we increase the communication with the provincial departments of environment, they have also their plans and also funds. Therefore, in order to, uh, it's very important that um, uh, committees um, develop the action plan, then this uh, action plan approved by the sub-provincial government and officially uh, submitted to the uh, provincial government, it uh, uh, can receive 
also support in terms of the trainings, capacity building of local community and uh, local environmental inspector and land officer, and also plus some funding which are coming from the use of water, uh, you know, from those uh, mining companies and uh, other private sector using, for example, the water resources. And recently in Mongolia, um, the fees for the water used by the private entities has been increased. And the amount of uh, fees accumulated at the provincial level. So when we increase the communication, I think the funds also comes along also the capacity building uh, opportunities uh, increase. So that's why we putting these um, plans together, really showing them and commenting all the stakeholders, these meetings and meeting minutes to, you know, for the submission. That the answer was. Thank yeah, great answer. Thank you very much. And I have the last question uh, for today, and this will be for Alexandra. So you said that the research on the environmental monitoring committees will focus on the key characteristics, challenges, and opportunities that strengthen them. But how exactly will this study be developed in the field? And how will you get the information from the committees? From the committees. OK, yes. So researchers will go twice to the field to, to visit every mining site. The first time, they will collect the data. The second time, they will verify it. And how this data will be collected? Um, through semi-structured interviews with with those that they will identify as the key informants. And then uh, with surveys for the broader community in which the committee works. So we have uh, designed, with the help of CIRD, different questionnaires for each one of these groups that are, of course, the monitoring committee members, but also those that surround them, let's say community members, government, mining companies, and other actors such as NGOs or universities. And um, some of the questions that, that they will be asked um, will be uh, linked to, for instance, the preparation of the committee, what was the event that triggered the, the formation of the committee, who put the idea forward. Uh, they will be asked how is the relationship between the community and, and the companies in terms of the vision of the monitoring committee they will be asked specific goals they have for the for the short, medium, long term, in terms of their plans and 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 capacity building that I also said is something we will focus on. They will we will try to make sure we know if someone from the committee receives training before they choose their monitoring scheme. Um, if the monitoring builds on existing institutions already, how much time they devote to, to communication, if they present their conclusions to the community or not. So, again, through all these questionnaires, uh, researchers will collect many data with many visions. So not only from the committee, but also from the people that is that surrounds them and, and from the mining companies and the public institutions involved as well. And after after they draw conclusions, they will go again to the sites, the places they have visited, to verify their conclusions are also accepted by, by the committees and by the people they already interviewed. That's how we will come up with, firstly, uh, uh, um, um, a report per country, but also we will, we will sort of fusionate all the reports and try to draw regional conclusions thanks to the examples from those five or six countries who will participate in the research. Fantastic. Thank you so much for this comprehensive result. Well, we have reached the end of, our, of um, the webinar. And Gati, I'd like to give the word to the presenters for a very brief last remarks, uh, one minute uh, max and would ask you to provide the concluding remarks for today's webinar, if that's fine with you. 
So maybe we could start with Alexander. Yeah, sure. Sure. Thank you very much. It was very interesting to participate and to learn from from these three study cases that have been presented. And uh, well, I hope by the end of the year I can present in this platform the results from the project I just introduced you to. So thank you very much to all, to the people who participate and who ask questions and see you soon. Okay, thank you. Flaviano, would you like to give any final remarks? Uh, well, I'd like to uh, thank you everybody for being here and uh, if you have more questions or uh, more comments, you can send me an email or, or go to our web page and that's it. Thanks a lot to everybody. Bolorma? Uh, yes, thank you very much. And I just would like to say one thing more, like uh, community-based environmental rehabilitation of degraded land was really uh, important because then the community learned how to do degradation, uh, rehabilitation of degraded land by mining and then they got all of the knowledge and skills and this actually empowers them how to how many companies doing the rehabilitation but also provides more opportunity to engage with the money companies to do rehabilitation work so that was uh, that's why i want to really all over the world people also engage in rehabilitation work of the mining degraded lands because mining has to allocate the funds for rehabilitation and community people can be engaged on this work so this is really important for this sustainability. So thank you very much. I learned so much also from other presenters. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you so much. And Gachi, would, like, would you like to provide concluding remarks for this webinar? OK, thank you. Uh, well, it was very nourishing talk. And I was thinking um, from each of the presenters some reflections. Uh, when Alex was talking about the best practices, I was thinking the importance of of trust, you know, and transparency, and in the sense, who convenes the committee, uh, where does the money come from, you know, all this funding for technical studies. I mean, all those are, I think, are topics that would provide trust in the in, in the spaces and the and the, and the conclusions also the asymmetry you know how do we deal with this big asymmetry uh, among the information of of the community of different communities sometimes uh very very um uh different like when we have isolated indigenous communities in the jungle you know sometimes they they even they, they don't even speak our language. Uh, Flaviano put uh, remarks the importance of technical information, which is key. So this brings the question of who will be, you know, participating in these roles, um, because I think it's it's um, very important that uh, we um, we realize that. Um, Beyond, you know, some some uh, attitudes of the companies in helping communities with with well-being, you know, or education that some sometimes they are lack of, and and and, and there is a hope that the companies could do this. Uh, we we really put the the, the focus on, on on controlling, you know, health and and also as Voloma was mentioning the importance of a human right approach no and i think in this in this topic the 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 the, the guiding principles on business and human rights from the un are very interesting i mean mainly on the due diligence of the companies and and from the oscar presentation uh, um, i also think that it's how important is the advance of the institutionalization of this kind of a community um, com committees, uh, the advance of um, institutions, but also the advance of legislations for key stakeholders, you know, as, as the financial institutions who are, have the influence on the companies. And I think in, in Peru, there is a very good um, uh, 
uh, example with a, with a resol the resolution from 2015 on, on the importance of, of, of uh, social and environmental responsibility that that uh, there are you know uh, uh, very strict reports that companies have to have to present in order to to get you know the money for their for their projects. So I think we have a huge <laughs> challenges in in helping these committees to 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 be more uh, uh, strong and to and to really you know play this role of controlling, preventing uh, conflicts in, in in health and and in mitigating environmental impacts and and strength you know as as we were mentioning uh this democratic ways of 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 uh, of sustainable development uh, so i want also to thank you everyone it was very interesting to me to listen to each of you and and also the audience and the good questions hey thank you so much uh Gadchi. and again on behalf of the ambisa forum and the Goxi Learning Series, as well as UNDP and the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency. Thank you all of our attendees um, of the Environmental Governance and Mining Webinar Series. Uh, for all of you, the MBSAP Forum is a global partnership to support the development and implementation of effective national biodiversity strategies and action plans, the MBSAPs. And it is hosted by the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity the United Nations Development Program, and the United Nations Environment Program. Now, GOXI is a standing online forum for innovation and collaboration across stakeholder groups, countries, and initiatives that aims to strengthen governance of the extractive sector. Now, this is the first webinar of the Environmental Governance Webinar Series in 2018. Tomorrow, we will host the same webinar in Spanish, but we invite you all to join us on 21 February for a next webinar on the role of government in preventing or enabling conflict in the extractive sector. So please don't forget to register and um, join us at 9 a.m. on the 21st. After today's webinar, I would like to invite all of you to fill out the feedback survey that you will receive via email. Your feedback is valuable for us to improve our e-learning offers. Now to conclude, I would like to invite you all to check out the mbsatforum.net website to continue this conversation and to get the recording of today's webinar and the presentations uh, from today. All of these will be posted after tomorrow's webinar. I also invite you to visit our YouTube channel where you can watch all sessions provided by the MBSAT Forum. And finally, please stay tuned for our next sessions in 2018. And for more information, please visit the MBSAT Forum or follow us in Facebook and Twitter. I'm Eva Gurria from the MBSAT Forum team and hope you all enjoyed the session. Have a nice rest of your day or your night. Goodbye and thank you again.